Today is week two of a series called Summer Mixtape. Back in the day, we would record these special collections of songs onto cassette tapes or CD. Now, a bunch of you people don't even know what those things are, but I will let you know that they were really cool devices. They've kind of gone the way of the dodo bird, but it was like a, it was, the, 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 the mixtape was like a playlist. Okay, everybody knows playlist, except it was a lot of work, and you would do it for someone that you love or someone that you wanted to love you back. So for the month of June, we're checking out five different sets of verses written by this early church leader named Paul. He's written to five different churches that he had helped start. And, and by extension, this mixtape, and the reason we're bringing it to you is it, it is for all of you here today who have decided to follow Jesus. The first song on the tape we heard last week from Pastor Mike did an awesome job kicking us off talking about grace, love, and peace. That was last week when we found out that even though keeping the peace is a good thing, a better thing is what? To be a peacemaker, right? And that's our destiny as Christ followers. So let's dig into week two with a reading from Philippians chapter four. Verse one, this is what we read. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat, we have a whole lot of uh, people about to have babies. Here's some possible baby names for you. I entreat Judea and I entreat Cynthia to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together. Here's another one with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice those things or these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord, and we're grateful for it. Amen? Just about a month ago, we were neck deep in looking at this book called James. Uh, James was no joke, right? Six weeks unveiling what Jesus' half-brother James wrote down. A and the reason it was no joke is because James was a no-nonsense guy, and so his style of writing was very practical, hands-on. He's saying, like, here's a handbook on how to live life as a Christian. That's what he was all about. And when I reread re the book of Philippians, it reminds me of the Apostle Paul's version of James. If you have decided to follow the way of Jesus, listen, you can find some very practical wisdom in the book of Philippians. I like something uh, Pastor Mike said last week when he said this. He said, following Jesus is solution-based living. I like that a lot. Did you know that God's not trying to trick you? Did you know that God's not sitting up in heaven right now saying, like, oh, I gave them this really confusing book, and there's no way they're ever going to figure it out, right? Jesus is not LOLing at, in, at you, in other words, right? And in fact, Jesus never asks a question that his word will not answer, and Philippians has a lot of practical advice. That's kind of for free. If you haven't got a soap guide, get a soap guide on the way out. Joe, Joe and the team will have uh, soap guides for you three months that we're uh, digging into. Read the Bible every day because you, you need that. So, he, so listen, uh, there's a lot of practical advice. For instance, you might ask, hey, hey what are some habits that I should have if I make Jesus the ruler and leader of my life. I think that'd be, a, I, you know, I know good habits are essential for success, so what are the habits I should be practicing? Philippians has got some answers. In fact, Paul's going to specifically mention a few things, like in verse 1 when he said, here's a good habit, stand firm in your faith. Here, here, here's another good one, verse 3, help fellow Christians in their work for God. How, how about a habit we find in verse 4 called rejoice constantly? Paul says, I'd recommend this habit, verse 5, be reasonable to everyone. Another one, verse 6, another one. If you're worried, practice the habit of releasing your worries in prayer. 
Anybody getting these habits? How about, how about you make it a habit to receive and look for the kind of peace God offers you? That's where we were last week, actually. Hey, hey, Christians, here's another one. In the middle of all the nonsense that comes across your television called news or on your social media feeds, here's one. Practice the habit of staying focused on good things, focused on wholesome things. Here's another one. When you see something modeled in front of you that you would know is right when you see it, you say, that's good. That's something that God is saying. Practice what you've seen modeled. Habits. The reason our theme for this year is faithfulness, the reason that we're shouting out to be together, God make us true to your word, is listen, being a Christian means something. <laughs> to be a follower of Christ is to be someone who looks and acts and listens and talks differently. There's just something different about them. I want to repeat uh, something I said a few weeks back, a, a question I asked. I asked this question, what promises are we making as a church to our community? I mean, what can people expect to experience uh, when they show up here and they get involved in this community called Broad River Church? Let me make it more real because I haven't got everybody leaning in with me yet, and I need all of you to lean in with me. What are you promising the people in your life? What can they expect to experience in their lives because they have proximity to you? Well, I just kind of learned how to under-promise and under-deliver, <laughs> right? You know, Pastor, if I never, I don't know who I'm making fun of here, but it's somebody. I don't, even, I don't have anybody in mind. You know, if I never make any promises, then no one will ever expect anything from me, and then they won't be disappointed when I don't end up doing anything or being anything or acting differently. And not only is that sad and hopeless, it's a sad and hopeless way to do this thing called humanity. I, I, don't, I don't even recommend that even if you're not a follower of Jesus, and by the way, if that's you today, we are so glad that you're here. This is a place you can belong before you believe. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, under-promising and under-delivering, that is a loser mentality all the way around. Paul says, don't be a loser. And wait for it. If you're a follower of Jesus, bigger than all of that, living that way is not even an option for you. In fact, just right in here in what we read today is this very clear, clear list of eight habits. Put that list back up, if you would, Roberto. There, there they are. Just these things by themselves could keep us busy for the rest of our lives. If we made up our minds to practice them, I wanted you to see the list. And as you look at the list, let me put two things in your mind. First of all, there are two words that sit underneath everything that are written in the book of Philippians. They are foundational for these eight habits and for a couple of other verses we're going to read before we're done. Last week, the key words were grace, hope, and or, or grace, love, and peace. Here's just two words that sum up Philippians. It's joy and rejoicing. Get that. Everybody say joy and rejoicing. There's 104 verses in this letter Paul wrote. He uses the Greek word joy and rejoicing 16 different times. So that's the first thing that you need to know. The second thing, this letter that highly features these two words. Come on, what are these two words from Philippians? This letter was written from prison. A dingy Roman prison. Prison is a place we associate with what? Misery being in a trial, being put away. Those things sound like the opposite of joy and rejoicing to me. This name, man named Paul is out here surrounded by every conceivable obstacle to joy. So then why, as I read Philippians, does he seem so happy? There's, there's the, those are the, the two things you need to know, joy and rejoicing, and that this joy emerges from a place that joy doesn't normally emerge from. I need you to know those two things. If you got that, say got it. All right, I want to give the big thing early away early today. I want you to write this down wherever you're taking notes. Come on, write this down. Believers can rejoice with Christ in all things. Come on, everybody read that with me, and we're going we're gonna to read it twice. Which is, first of all, let's just practice. Let's read it together. Believers can rejoice with Christ in all things. 
All right, I got about 70% of you reading with me there. So we'll get 100 next time. Now, this time we're going to read it. We're going to emphasize the word rejoice, and then we're going to slow down emphatically like you're preaching it. We're going to say in all things, all right? Like there's a period after each of the last three words. Let's read together. Nice, loud voice. Believers can rejoice with Christ in all things. Very good. You, so you got the backstory. Verse 1 has a phrase that, 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 that tells you how that can happen. How is it that that can happen? How is it that you can rejoice with Christ in all things? Check out verse number 1. It says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. Paul says, Hey, Christians! Be standing firm. Be a person that stands firm. That phrase, stand firm, comes from the Greek word stekos. Stekos means steadfast. It means to stand firm, to persevere, to persist, to keep one standing. It's all about having a strong base. Right, you have a strong base. I was telling the, the first service today, I grew up in a church where, where uh, sometimes when people would get prayed for at the front, they, they would fall over. You ever seen a church like this? People pray for and they fall over. And listen, I believe God has a power to push people over, and I, I pray for people that have fallen down. This is not about doubting that experience at all. I was raised a Pentecostal, so all you need to know is we believed in everything, all right? So all the stuff, we did all the stuff, all right? But I went to this one meeting one time, this very high-powered evangelist. was He was uh, one of these guys that when he prayed for people, they fell down. And so there's like 10 pastors lined up. By the way, this story, I, I realize Pastor Jacinda doesn't have anything to do with making the sermon better. It's just funny. Okay, so if anybody's hoping, it, you're not going to get something big. It's just funny. Okay, so 10 pastors lined up, and the, uh, he's going down. He's, he's praying for people. They're falling over. Everybody heard, I believe God can do that, right? Y'all have heard that. I'm not mocking that experience. But I could see guy number five or six, pastor number five or six, homeboy was not going down. <laughs> he had decided up front, I'm not going down, right? And so what do people do when they, they want to make a strong base when you're standing firm? What, what do they do to stand firm? They, they drop the leg, right? So homeboy drops his leg, and he's like braced, right? And he did not go down. Now, later in the service, he did end up going down because that, that's when the, the, the preacher broke out the, the, the suit coat. Listen, when the suit coat comes out, you're going down, all right? So you, you can't stand up when the suit coat goes down. Y'all know that. Okay. So, so, but the, it's about having a strong base, that's how good buildings get built. I mean, the buildings that last, I, I've told you, I've been praying for you since last September. I've prayed before that about you, but this has been in my heart. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a leading thing that I'm praying about as we head towards sabbatical. I've been praying, what, that you would finish well. I want you to make it to the end. I want you to receive the reward. I want you to have eternal life with Jesus. I want you to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servants. And in order for those structures to remain standing, that base, that foundation, it needs to be wider than the layers above the base, or at least the base needs to have a strong, secure foundation in some way. This is what this year is about, Broad River Church. Faithfulness. Our foot needs to be on solid ground so that we can stand, so that we can remain steadfast no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. Somebody hear me. I am not a doom and gloom guy. I am not a fire and brimstone guy. I'm not a turn or burn preacher. That's not what I've ever done, but I need you to know something today with what is coming to this world and what is coming to God's church. If you don't have a strong foundation, if you haven't learned how to be steadfast, I wish I could say it any other way, but I can't. You will not make it. And even as I say that, I recognize hearing a statement like that, I don't even want to say it, but when I, you hear a statement like that, it makes most of us, or many of us, makes us want to just shut down. Hard times are coming. Bad circumstances are coming. Okay, I hear you say, if it's going to be hard, then I just better just, what, circle up the wagons, simplify things. I need to worry about me. I need to worry about myself. I need to worry about I. I just need to keep this, my side of the street clean. That's how we respond. It, it's going to be tough enough, so that's what I'm going to do. Right? I already told you, Pastor Kevin, I'm not making any promises so I don't have to deliver on anything. I don't want anybody expecting anything from me. And get this, Paul knows that's, at, that's our instinct. 
He knows that we revert to checking out of the game. That's the status we revert to the quickest. It was the same in his day as it is ours. He knows it, so he's going to put Jesus front and center of what it looks like to be steadfast. He's going to point to Jesus. We're going to see this, but before we see that, what are the two foundational words that Philippians is built on? Two words. What are they? That's it. There's, there, there's, that's the theme, and, and help me out with this. Where is this letter that is just saturated in that language? Where was it written from? Help me out. Prison. From prison, right? A place that is the exact opposite of what he thinks about when we think about joy and rejoicing. So good. Now watch Paul point to Jesus. I need you to know what I mean when I say steadfast. We didn't read from chapter 2, but these are the three most famous verses from this letter. Chapter 2, verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Leave that up there. Here's what steadfast looks like. And it's Jesus who shows steadfastness as he models being a servant. This verse is all about hierarchy and position. And when things get tough for Jesus, he doesn't close up shop and decide the best thing is just to take care of himself and what serves him best. No, Paul says Jesus' position is the position of a servant. Actually, that word servant is the Greek word doulos, which means a slave. Can we see that next screen? It means a slave. It means a bondsman. It means one who gives himself up for another's will. The doulos is someone who is used by Christ in extending and advancing the cause of Christ to the people in his or her life. Listen, the doulos get this, is someone who is so devoted to other people so much that they disregard their own interests. We, we have a uh, we have an awesome the, 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 the word doulos sounds like another word that's in our in our uh, our vocabulary these days what is that other word it's the word doula right we have an awesome doula in our church her name is Tori and w what is it that a, that a doula does we a doula comes along and supports and serves who mothers when we're in there in labor. I'm asking you to talk a lot today. I just need it, okay? Just help me out, okay? <laughs> she supports and serves mothers when they're in labor. The doula is based on this word doulos. The, the picture, this picture of Jesus is, is pretty complete because we see him rejoicing and living a life of joy, first of all, while he is suffering. And in the same picture, we see Jesus rejoicing while he is serving others. I'm, I'm afraid that we have bought into an idea that is in our culture that is anti-Christ. And here's the idea, is that enjoyment in life comes when we can get all the other stuff out of the way and just focus on ourselves. And Paul says... No, that's exactly the wrong idea. In fact, you can rejoice and live a life joy better when? When you're serving others. Believers in Christ can rejoice in all things. And here's part of what that means. I want you to get this Broad River Church. Write this down. Followers of Jesus serve others well. Write that down wherever you're taking notes. Listen, being a follower of Jesus isn't just about I got saved and now I kind of walk around with kind of a, a serene look on my face and I'm just kind of weird for the rest of my life. That's not what being a follower of Jesus is, okay? Being a follower of Jesus isn't just about thinking positive thoughts about others, right? Sending out good vibes for all humans into the universe. No, if we're going to be faithful people, we will learn to practice the discipline of thinking of the needs of others and sharing what we have when others need it. Jesus modeled this so well, so we repeat it. What, what did Jesus model? He modeled servanthood. What is the position that Jesus modeled? He, 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 he modeled second place, the lower position. In fact, Read verse 7 with me again from chapter 2. It says, But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness 
of man. Read those first three words with me of Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Let's say it together. But emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself. Man, I need you to get this. Paul is talking about joy from prison, and here's what he says. Here's how I figured out how life works. I remember Jesus who experienced joy this way. You ready? He emptied himself out. He gave everything he had to give. He didn't hold anything back, and he went to his death, not just any normal death. He went to death the very worst way possible. What does standing firm look like? Here's what I've learned from my joy guy in prison. Here's what I learned from Jesus rejoicing on his way to the cross. I can rejoice even when I'm suffering, and I can rejoice even when I am serving others. Since I already brought up the doula, we've already been thinking about babies. And listen, y'all, Broad River Church has babies on the brain. I was talking to somebody before service who is, is pregnant and mentioned that, uh, that we, as far as we know, we have 10 women in, in our church right now that are, are having babies. And then we have four more at our Sono location. And, and I know others that are praying and planning in, in that direction as well. So, and, and, and Pastor Sint and I are kind of have babies back on the brain because uh, we have a new grandbaby, a new baby boy, and that's been fun. Um, and, and, and since I, I, I've, I've been around newborns and their mothers, I, I have to tell you what God is showing me, specifically when I was reading Philippians this week. Next, next week is Father's Day, so we'll get to fathers next week, okay? The, the good news is none of the fathers were going to get offended, right? They were, it's like, whatever, nobody ever cares about us anyway. So, like, here's, but, but as I've watched Sheridan with Bo, as I've watched uh, yesterday, I watched uh, Pastor Lauren with, with Miles, other babies in our church. Let's just call it what it is. What is a mother, especially in those first few months, what is going on there? It's servanthood. The mother takes the lesser spot in order to serve, better serve her newborn. Come on, get your mind here with me in this stage of life mothers go into. Here's the stage of life where there are tasks that are required to take care of someone, listen, who can't quite take care of those needs on their own yet. Paul is all about this idea in this letter. He's going to talk over and over again about servanthood. He's going to remind the believers in the church at Philippi. He's going to remind me and you to serve others, to be humble, to work hard with the bodies that he gave us, and pay attention to other people who are doing the same thing and model that. I, I think it's helpful for us to, to this morning not just to think about who God might be calling you to serve, but asking why is he calling me to serve them? Listen to me. One of the reasons God calls you to serve other people in your life is that some of them are not mature enough yet to serve themselves. Some of you are frustrated with the people in your life because they are not handling things the way you would handle them if you were them. But the truth is, Many of those people that you're frustrated with just don't have the ability to do it yet. Listen, two years ago, you couldn't do it either, but now that you can do it, now you expect everybody else to do what you couldn't do two years ago. You expect everyone to start acting like you've learned how to act, but it took you some time. I've seen some of you grow. It took you some time to get there. And God has put you in the place to take the place of servant to the people in your life. Here's something we can promise Fairfield County as a church. Here's something that you can show up expecting from us here, from the outside coming in. Here's what you can expect. We're going to serve you. We've got to own this at the deepest place, Broad River Church. We're going to take second place. It's why we build new buildings. It's why we ask people to give up their seats at their favorite service and start attending a service at a different time so that other people can have a place to sit down when they show up because we have learned that we can rejoice while we are serving others. Stop expecting the babies in your life to act like adults. They aren't there yet. We have to learn how to discipline our minds. We have to learn this is what he says here and how he winds these verses up. Let me say it this way. Christian, you don't get to think like everybody else because Jesus is changing the way that you think. In fact, 
That's where we'll end today. This is how to stand firm. This is how to be faithful. This is how to rejoice in all things, to be disciplined in the way that you think. Paul goes through this whole list of habits we need to add. It's a lot. But he uses this wrap-up word at the beginning of verse 8. Put verse 8 up there. He says, finally, brothers. I can almost hear him adding, I get it. What I, this list of habits, it's a lot. Staying focused on wholesome and good things, it's a lot. Releasing your worries in prayer, it's a lot. Receiving and looking for the kind of peace God offers, it's a lot. But I know Jesus isn't trying to confuse me. I know he's not going to ask me to do anything I can't do without his help. I know that the way of Jesus is solution-based living. So help us out, Paul. And he says, I got you. Finally, brothers and sisters, we're going to file all of this underneath. You have to be disciplined in the way that you think. What does the scripture say? How, how are we transformed? Paul says it somewhere else. We are transformed how? By the renewing of our what? We have to be disciplined. Christian, you have to be disciplined the way that you think. Here's a playlist inside of a playlist. Things that we allow our minds to dwell on. Here's what's included. Things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. Things that are excellent. Things that are praiseworthy. That's what a faithful person thinks about. Check out that playlist. Let me ask you this question. When you think about the mixtape that replays in your mind, normally plays in your mind, what that normally plays in your mind would make the cut here? What would have to go? What has to go that your norm, mind normally dwells on? It makes me think about listening to a certain kind of playlist. How many of you listen to a certain kind of playlist because you just kind of feel sad or maybe sometimes we kind of want to feel a little more melancholy so we listen to the playlist, but then long after we turn the sad songs off and we're not listening to them anymore, we're still sad, right? It has an, it has an effect on us. Paul says, what's your playlist? I want to end today by asking this question, what's your playlist? In other words, you don't get to think about just whatever you want to as a believer. There's a certain playlist that gets the majority of your thinking. He said, think about those things that are true. Think about those things that are honorable. Think about those things that are just. Think about those things that are pure. Those things that are lovely. Well, Pastor, I'd like to think about those things just as soon as I can get everything else worked out in my, my life, as soon as I the day goes right. If the day would just go right, then I could think about those things. You're missing the point. You got to start there. Well, you know, I, I made up my mind on Monday morning. I was going to think about whatever was just and honorable and a good report. But then I got up in the morning and my wife was mean to me. She didn't treat me right. My husband didn't treat me right. So I just never got around to letting the playlist be the right playlist. You're missing the points. What's your playlist? Some of you have been making moves. God is doing things in your life. I see it happening. And God's saying now, keep coming this way. Keep cleaning up your thinking. How do you clean up your thinking? Ephesians says that we are cleaned with the washing of the Word. Grab a soap guide on your way out and get into God's Word. What's your playlist? Stand firm. You can rejoice in all things. Stand firm. Be steadfast. Let's pray together. Close your eyes with me all over this room. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your words of truth that are life to us. Thank you, Lord, that as we come into your house, that there is no condemnation, that we are not condemned, that we are not judged because of the way that we lived even yesterday or even this morning. But, Lord, you said that if we would confess our sins, that you were faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from everything that stood in the way of relationship with you. And that's what we want, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you stood firm. Thank you, Jesus, that you are bread for the hungry, that you are water to the thirsty, that you are Savior. And, Lord, thank you that you were obedient all the way to the cross, dying a death that you didn't deserve, dying in our place. We're the ones that deserved it, but you stood firm. You took second place. You emptied yourself out. Lord, help us to be a people that follows your example. I want to pray for just some people in this room today who maybe have never made a decision to follow Jesus. As I look across this room, 
there are some people here that would just say, you know, as, as we were singing, as, as you were speaking, maybe even as soon as you got here and sat down, you just knew that something was different about today and that you, you need to take a step forward, that you need to take a step out, that you need to say with your mouth and with your heart and with your mind, I want to follow Jesus. Maybe it's a decision that you made a long time ago. Maybe it's a decision that you've never made, but I want you to know today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus is calling your name. The scripture says his spirit is literally drawing you to himself. So if that's you today and you'd like to make a decision to follow Jesus, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. And it's not the prayer that saves you. It's, it's, it's your faith in Christ that saves you. And so I want you to just repeat this prayer after me and make today, June 9th, 2024, the first day of the rest of your life. It's the best decision that you'll ever make. If that's you today, nobody's looking around, all the heads are bowed, all the eyes are closed so that you can have this moment with God. But I would love to know who I'm leading in prayer. If that's you today, would you just lift your hand where you are? Just let me know by the lifting of your hand that you'd like to make this decision to follow Jesus. Well, if that's you, lift your hand wherever you are today. Broad River Church, let's pray with those that are making this decision today. Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for your resurrection and the new life that I have in you. Now I give you my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen.